People can be electrocuted in a number of ways. I would say that most people, when they think of an electrocution, think of a, a household incident, you know, someone putting something into a socket, someone trying to get something out of a toaster, wires getting uh, crossed when you're trying to install a fan. Electrocutions can occur from many places, including the power lines that run through um, residential neighborhoods and backyards. And, uh, in the cases that I handle, that's generally what we're uh, what we're looking at: uh, electrocutions involving actual power lines. Power lines run above ground; they run underground. Um, obviously, the underground ones are less of an issue with vegetation, but still can be an issue because if you're going to dig around plants, you got to make sure there's no lines that you're going to hit with the shovel because that can electrocute you. In the cases that I've been involved in, and what I've seen is in many neighborhoods, there are still overhead power lines. Uh, most of the power companies in Florida are converting those now. So they're burying the lines in some cases, putting them underground, or they're moving rear yard installations and putting them in the front yard. Um, because in the rear yard, you have children that are playing, you've got landscapers, you've got tree trimmers, and anyone doing any sort of work or play around power lines is at serious risk. So to answer your question, so if you're, you own a home and you happen to be in one of those homes where the power lines are still above ground, they're literally right in your backyard or right behind your backyard, and your trees are getting close. If they're getting so close that they're actually hitting the power lines and you're hearing buzzing noises, vibration noises, you're seeing sparking, you're seeing arcing, absolutely, first thing you do is you don't go near it. Don't go anywhere near the power lines. The first thing you do is you call your electric utility, whoever that is. In Florida, that might be FPNL, that might be LCEC, uh, but you call your power company and you report it. And what should happen, that doesn't always happen, is you're calling in what's called a customer trim request. So you're the customer, this is your house, and you're requesting that the power company come and trim the trees because you have a concern. You have a concern that either the power is going to go out because the vegetation is hitting the line, or someone's going to get hurt. So call your power company. Now, if your power company doesn't come out and do the trimming, um, then you really have to look to um, hiring a qualified line clearing specialist or tree trimmer that has experience trimming vegetation around power lines. Um, I've been involved in too many unfortunate cases where the utility company, for whatever reason, refuses to come out and trim the line and tells you to just wait till the next time they come and do their routine maintenance, which is every six years on average. Um, people don't want to wait. They hire people. They don't know who to hire, and these people aren't trained sometimes to work around power lines, and oftentimes then tragedy happens when a landscaper or a tree trimper trims a branch, it hits the power line, and they end up getting electrocuted. The power companies have gotten approved by something called the Florida Public Service Commission, or the PSC, a what we call a planned maintenance schedule which basically says how often they are required to trim the trees around their power lines. Um, right now, what the law says is that they have to trim every six years on average. And that on average is, is a very Im key important word that was included very intentionally. Because if you think about it, if you've got four houses on this street, and each one of them has trees in the backyard. If this tree has to be inspected three times in a year, this house over here could have their trees never inspected, ever, and the utility will still meet the six-year average because it's the average for the entire line. They don't have to do every house on the line. So I've been involved in cases where despite the six-year average, power company had never done planned maintenance, had never come and done cyclical line clearing um, on those houses, and they still met their six-year average. Now, it, that's one division, and this is more particular to FP&L, 
So they have plan maintenance, which we just talked about, six years on average. And then they have what we call um, the preventative maintenance, which is generated because there's a complaint. So if someone calls in and calls in a customer term request, that's different. What happens in those cases is fp &L will send out one of their tree trimming contractors. Um, actually, before that, they'll send out one of their inspectors. So fp &L works with various companies, I would say, in their vegetation management around power lines. The way I characterize it is fp &L is the is the captain of the team. And then they've got companies that work for them to audit, inspect the vegetation trimming. So you call in and say, I've got arcing and sparking in my line. I'd like fp &L to come out and trim. They will first send out an inspector. Um, they will write up what's called a trouble ticket. Their inspector will go out and inspect the condition. And what they're looking for is, is there sufficient clearance between the vegetation and the power line? Now there's a big, not everybody's in agreement as to what sufficient clearance is. So during the plan maintenance, which I talked about, the every six years, they are to obtain, by rule, by their own rules, this is fp &L again, 8 to 12 feet on average of clearance between the nearest growth on the tree or any vegetation and the power line. On average, which means for some species that are fast growing, you might need to get 20 or 30 feet because remember, it's going to be growing for six years towards the power line and they're not coming back. So um, when you call on the customer term request, so the inspector will go out and determine is there sufficient clearance. Now, I would say sufficient clearance is sufficient clearance. And if it's 8 to 12 feet at your time of plan maintenance for a reason to allow regrowth time, then when you go out to trim because the tree is already hitting the line, you should obtain that at least same 8 to 12 or more. That's generally not what I found is the power company's position. Their position in a lot of cases, and in fact in the case I'm involved in right now, is essentially this. If the vegetation contact is not so significant that it's cutting the power out, it can wait. It can wait till we come around for plan maintenance. If it's not turning the power out, it's not stopping the meters from running. fp loses money when the meters stop running. So if it's just hitting and causing some sparking, the meter's still running and they don't come out and trim. Generally has been my experience. Um, a case I'm involved in now, I have four neighbors who all called fp saying they were sparking and arcing in the trees. fp went out, did not perform trimming of a line that was growing directly into the primary line. The homeowner didn't want to wait, went out and hired a tree trim, her normal landscaper she called to come out. Um, it was a jungle in the backyard around there, um, and he ended up doing fp job and cutting the tree, and um, he's gone. He was electrocuted when the branch he cut landed on the power line and created a circuit of energy because trees and vegetation often can conduct electricity. So when the branch hit the line, power goes through the branch, into him, he's electrocuted and killed. Step one is you, you call the power company, you call them again, you call them a third time because they have the people who are trained to do this and they are the people who should be doing this. And it's going to cost more money to trim more trees. We all get that. You know, the more trimming they do, the more money it's going to cost, but the more lives they're going to save. So um, my answer is call the power company, call the power company, call the power company. If they absolutely refuse, you really have to try to find someone who has solid experience working around power lines and doing vegetation management. And in this case, and in many of the cases I've been involved in, fp and will say, um, this can wait till planned maintenance, so we're not going to send somebody out to trim now. However, if you do decide to trim it yourself, make sure you hire a qualified line clearing specialist or a certified tree trimmer. Now that's interesting because I've been what I do, I've got to take the deposition of many, many, many uh, people who work for these utility companies, and none of them know what that means. 
Um, they don't know what a qualified wine clearing specialist is, and they don't know how to find one. So I say, so easier said than done, because if the power company doesn't know who to call, how are you in the public going to know who to call? They don't give you a list of certified contractors. Here's our list. Call them. They'll do it. They don't tell you where to find them. Um, but you just have to call around and, and, and make sure. Obviously, power company is number one, but if they absolutely refuse, you got to make sure um, you have you are certified to work around power lines um, because the homeowner you know has can have liability in these situations as well but really it shouldn't come down to the homeowner if the power company was just was just doing their job you get electrocuted on your own property um, and again we're talking about the power line type electrocutions not the household type electrocutions um, it depends on the circumstances of the case so if it's, as I've said in the past, where the homeowner is has trees in their backyard, they have a, a, you know, the power company has an easement with power lines running through it in their backyard, and they have an obligation to, to maintain that. So if you as a homeowner, your trees are growing into the power lines, you should just, you should call the power company and ask them to come out and trim. If they refuse to trim, and um, you, I wouldn't advise this, but if you called multiple times and you couldn't find someone else to trim the tree and you made what I'm going to consider to be a mistake and decided to trim the tree yourself, um, that could be dangerous, you could be hurt, you could be electrocuted. Even in that situation where you do that and you're the one who went to trim the trees, I still you think you have a potential claim against the power company because you have to think of what we call the, the, the but for analysis is, which is but for the power company not doing their job when you call them, you're out there doing it yourself and you shouldn't have to be doing it yourself. So, you know, I would say in that situation, um, you would get in contact likely with an attorney experienced with handling electrocution claims and electrocution accidents and investigate to see whether you have a potential claim against the power company for not doing their job and trimming the trees. Again, I've been involved in many cases where someone gets hurt on someone's property and there's blame to go around, so to speak, uh, or at least people cast blame around. Um, some people get hurt, will they don't know whose fault it is, so they don't know the law on the issue. They don't know if it's the power company's obligation to keep the trees out of the power lines, or is it the homeowner's obligation to keep their uh, their trees from growing into the power lines. If you ask the power company, they might say the latter. Um, if you ask me, you might say the former. So the first thing is you want to try to avoid someone getting hurt on your property. So if there's trees growing in your power lines, call the power company, call the power company, call the power company. Because usually when someone's getting hurt on your property, it's because you, you've allowed them on your property to either try to trim the vegetation themselves, and they may be untrained, uh, or I've been involved in many cases where people are, they want to go in your backyard and pick fruit from your fruit tree. So they want to knock avocados or mangoes off your tree, and you've got and the, your tree is very close to the power lines. You'd have to be very, very careful when you're inviting anyone onto your property where there's power lines especially when you have knowledge of a potential issue because that knowledge of the potential issue makes you as the homeowner have some potential liability or responsibility if somebody gets hurt so if you hire an untrained tree trimmer and say go trim this tree around the power lines that the power company wouldn't and they get hurt they might be looking to you as a responsible party um, if you invite someone in back in your backyard to knock mangoes off your tree and you know your mango tree is six inches away from the power line and they're going to be using a long metal pole to knock the fruit off um, you need to either warn them or tell them to stay on the other side of the tree and at least 10 12 you know feet away from the power line um, or else you could have potentially liable you know you could be potentially responsible yourself some might say and there's a debate on this that the term electrocuted would imply that you've, you've received an electric shock and you've died. Um, and some may say if you've survived, you have a severe electric shock injury. So I, that's the way I'll use those terms. Electric shock injury, 
you've survived, and we have cases where people survive, usually with catastrophic burns and all sorts of terrible injuries, and then we have people who are electrocuted and, and are killed. If you survive a severe electric shock injury, um, or if you were the family member of someone who unfortunately was electrocuted fatally, um, and you're looking to for compensation for what's happened to you, um, you, you need to, to speak to an attorney who is familiar with handling these types of cases. Um, this is not, handling an electrocution case against the power company is not the same as handling a rear end car crash, you know, that happens on McGregor uh, Boulevard here in Fort Myers. Um, it's, it's a very specialized area. Um, the attorneys that work for the power companies do nothing but defend these cases. So you need someone who knows their rules, their policies and procedures um, as well or better than their own employees do. So if you're electrocuted or receive a serious electric shock injury, A, you should talk to an attorney and look at filing a potential claim if that's your goal. B, obviously, is you want to prevent this from happening to anyone else again. So you would hope you would call the power company again, and after someone was fatally electrocuted, they would come out and trim so that if anybody else was in your backyard, this didn't happen again. Um, I can go on and on, but I am... I have been involved in cases where that has not happened, where people have been literally fatally electrocuted because the power company didn't do the trimming right, and then after that fatal electrocution, they allowed the vegetation to remain in the same condition for years and years and years. You really just have to be persistent with the power company and be almost insistent that they come out and fix these problems, because if you don't, People end up in my office, and when they end up in my office, um, someone's been terribly, catastrophically injured or killed. Electrocution generally implies death. So someone is, uh, whatever, trimming a tree, they're, the electric current goes through them. It, there are many ways it can happen off it. It could stop your heart. Um, which deprives your brain of oxygen and you could end up dying. And that's that's electrocution. Electric shock injury implies that you've same mechanism, the electricity has gotten to you, but by some miracle, you've survived. So you've received a severe electric shock injury, but you haven't technically been electrocuted. Similar to the term drowning. So if someone drowned, that implies they died. They went underwater, they died, they never came out. If they went underwater and they nearly drowned, they just swallowed a lot of water, they didn't drown. They swallowed a lot of water and they almost drowned. So very similar. Electrocution implies death. Electric shock injury implies near electrocution, but not, not, not death. The only way really to be an expert in electrocution cases is, is to handle electrocution cases. We have handled, I'm going to say a dozen or so electrocution cases um, here at our firm. Um, the first case came to us because there are not a lot of attorneys in Florida that specialize in this type of work. In fact, the first electrocution case we had that came to us, which was a tragic case um, involving a 15-year-old boy. Um, I believe we were the fourth law firm involved in the case. The first three law firms got nowhere. This was a case against FPNL. Um, case came to us. Um, we took it over. Um, we started digging and working on it. And I essentially, myself and my partner, we made ourselves into electrocution experts. Um, we studied the policies and procedures of the power company, their vegetation management standards, the, uh, the requirements. So there's the, what we call the ANSI A300 requirements, the National Electric Safety Code Section 218. These are all laws and guidelines that talk about what you're supposed to do to have appropriate vegetation management around power lines. And then when you get involved in these cases, you get to take depositions. So I get to talk to 
um, linemen. I get to talk to arborists. I get to talk to the tree trimming contractors and inspectors and ask them about their job and what they're supposed to do and what they actually did in these cases. And after doing that, and these cases are very intense on discovery, so we get internal documents, we have emails, we have deposition transcripts, and by doing this, and now for, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years that we've been doing this with the multitude of cases we've had, um, I, I think I could comfortably say we, at least in this area, uh, I don't know of another firm that has the type of expertise that we have here handling these types of cases. Every time someone has an electric shock injury or is electrocuted with any involvement with a with a power line. So whether it's vegetation hitting the power line or somebody trimming a tree and hitting it with their, their pole saw, a report, a one-page report typically has to be sent by the power company to the Florida Public uh, Service Commission or the PSC. And it's usually just a report, you know, tree trimmer, vegetation contact, loss of life, date, something like that. Um, because we're involved in this, these types of cases, we have done significant discovery. And what that means is we have requested documents from the PSC to see how often this happens. And it, sh no pun intended, it shockingly happens all the time. Um, and there are two specific groups that it happens to more than anyone else. The cases I've been involved in, almost every one of them is in a residential neighborhood, usually lower income, that still has overhead power lines, and the lines only service 30 or 40 houses. Those houses get much less attention by the power companies than the lines that run down 41 here in Fort Myers. If one of those lines goes down, 50 businesses can be out of power and FPL is losing a lot of money because the meters aren't turning. That line in the poor neighborhood goes down and 23 houses lose power for a couple hours, it doesn't matter. And unfortunately that's kind of what we see. So what the statistics show is that the vast, vast majority of people who are being electrocuted, um, it's happening in residential rear yards and they are untrained tree trimmers landscapers and people picking fruit um, and it's over and over and over again the most troubling part of it for being an attorney who lives with these families and their grief and the problems they're going through is the fact that when i talk to the higher ups at these power companies and say what are you doing to prevent future tragedies right you've seen people you know tree trimmers are getting electrocuted, you know fruit pickers are doing, what are you doing to warn them? There is no answer. They're not trying to determine why this is happening and how they can fix it. It's, it's really, you know, I hate to say it, but it's really a profits over people type of mentality. It's, some people are gonna get hurt and killed, we're gonna have to pay out claims. We could trim a lot more, and probably less people would would get hurt or killed. And it's, in my mind, it's a math equation. And it's very expensive to trim those trees more. And so, what's it going to take? I don't know. I was asked that once in a in a you know in a case where someone died of of, of heat stroke, and and there's a simple fix to it. And we had a world-renowned expert in the case, similar to these types of cases, and he was asked in an interview similar to what I'm doing here, you know, Doc, what's it going to take um, to prevent a future tragedy? And in that case, similar to this case, he said, I guess a few more kids are going to have to die. And that was heat stroke in a high school. But here, you know, I don't know what it's going to take. Is it going to be more landscapers and fruit pickers that are going to have to die before FPNL goes out and trims the lines more? I don't know. There's no new legislation in the works. The, the other law that, that applies in these cases that does exist now is there's something called the Florida Tariff, okay? And most people have never heard of it. In fact, and before I had my first electrocution case, I had never heard of it. 
Um, but the Florida tariff is has the force of law in Florida, and it puts certain obligations on the power company. It also puts certain obligations on the homeowner. Um, so when I'm in these cases, FPNL says, read the tariff. The tariff says the customer has the obligation to make sure their trees don't grow into the power lines. And that is in part of the tariff. But then I always point them to the other section of the tariff, which they don't want to talk about, which is the part that says, you as a utility have an easement on this property, and you have the right to go into that easement to manage your facilities, which is their power poles or their power lines, their transformers, their equipment, and the vegetation around them at any time for any reason. If a customer refuses, you can legally go on their property and, and do this. So, you know, the law right now as it exists has certain obligations on both the power company and on the homeowner. As far as stronger legislation, I think the the best option for that would be the next time the, uh, you know, the power companies have to go in front of the PSC for getting their trim scheduling approved, that there be people like myself or people who have um, knowledge, you know, I, I, in my cases, I have expert arborists who are, who are experts in trimming vegetation around power lines. Um, I work with some of the people who ran some of the top power companies in the country. And those are the type of people who need to be up there arguing the opposite side and explaining to the legislature why we do need laws that say it's not good enough for you guys to trim every six years on average. Um, you need to ensure that there was there exists clearance between the vegetation and the power lines at all times. I've had cases, in fact, in almost every case I've had, where FPNL takes the position that when they do their every six year maintenance, once they obtain the clearance, their interpretation is, despite their policies and procedures saying the opposite, is that they don't have to maintain that clearance. Meaning they obtain eight feet and then they disappear for six years. But what we've argued and what I think the rules say is, the reason it says eight to 12 feet is the minimum, sometimes more is, if you've got a tree that you know is gonna grow 30 feet over six years, well, guess what? You've got to move it 30 or 50 feet back from the power line, and then you could wait six years. But what they're doing is doing the minimum trimming and then not maintaining it. And generally what's happening is people are calling because the trees have grown back in the power lines. They haven't come back. And, and again, you, you know, if you're lucky enough to be one of the few people that they'll come out and trim for, um, you know, like if it's starting a fire or if the power line's coming down, they're going to come out. But short of that, it's near impossible to get them to come out and do trimming um, on their own. In fact, because I do this so much, I'm, I'm a regular on FPNL's website. <laughs> I read their frequently asked questions, and that was one of them. <laughs> okay. Um, and what they would say is if there is sparking or arcing, you call us because we have qualified tree trimmers to come out and do the job. Um, the case I'm involved right now, which is an electrocution death case, I had four neighbors, including the house where the tragedy happened. All two of them called in and say they visually saw sparking and arcing on more than one occasion. And FPNL did not come out despite that. If, if it's not a threat to what they call reliability, which means keeping the lights on, um, they're not going to come out. So they, if you want someone to come out, you have to, what I would say is this, um, I'm concerned someone's going to get hurt. The trees are in the line, they're arcing and sparking, there's kids that play here, um, and you're essentially putting them on notice um, that if something happens, we've told you um, what's going on, we've told you the condition is serious, and you've ignored it. So, I mean, obviously, if they do ignore it, you stay away from the power lines. But yeah, the, the more serious the condition and the more likely it is that it's going to be something that results in the power going out, the more likely it is the power company is going to come out and fix it for you. My experience is the inspector goes out, he looks, he says, this is a condition that is not a threat to reliability. Um, and it can wait till planned maintenance. 
and they close the ticket out and that's the end of it. And then some people resort to self-help and some people don't and, you know, we have a, another case in this office. Um, you know, myself and my partner Ty Rowland handle most of the injury cases, so the severe electric shock injuries and the electrocution death cases, but this can damage property too. I, my, my partner Jack Morgan is handling a case right now. I think it's set to go to trial in a few weeks against FPL, where a tree got too close to a power line, it caused the fire and it burned a house down to the ground and the house is completely destroyed. So, you know, the, this vegetation and power lines just simply don't mix. The Dominguez case was the, the case I spoke about earlier. So three or four law firms had had the Dominguez case. And good lawyers, but not experienced in handling electrocution cases. Um, and that was the case I, I really sunk my teeth into because I connected with it in, in many ways. It was a 15-year-old boy. I think you know my son may have been a few years older than that at the time that I took the case. Um, and it just seemed like such a preventable tragedy uh, that just never should have happened. And we had this distraught mother who had lost her firstborn son for no good reason. The facts of the Dominguez case are, so Justin Dominguez was 15 years old and he lived in a poor neighborhood in San Carlos Park. And they had a grub above ground power lines running through their backyard. And I would describe the backyard as like a Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn type thing. It was streams and trees and vines and it was trails, like a kid's paradise. Little kids would have just run around and I would have run around and played with it when I was little. So, and just, he was the, the leader. He was the oldest of the, the cousins. So on this day, very, very unfortunately, um, his younger sister and younger brother and two younger cousins were all with him and they were playing in the trees in the backyard and it just so happened in this backyard there was a there were clumps of what we call of bamboo um, and this isn't the kind of bamboo you would think of as like a fishing rod this is what we call giant tree bamboo so the diameter is about this and there are little knobs or barbs on the side which are like a perfect ladder for a kid to climb so um, they were out playing and Justin was climbing one of the big pieces of bamboo and as it as he climbed with his weight it started to bend at the top and not knowing this of course and when he got to a certain height the tip of the bamboo hit the power line and unfortunately there's i'll tell you more about bamboo but one of the things about bamboo is it is a superconductor of electricity because it's hollow and it's filled with water so the second it hit the line the electricity went through the bamboo went through justin's body and saw it it's um uh, electricity is always seeking to get to ground earth as fast as it can so it'll travel through anything in its path and in this case it's traveled through justin um, and it stopped his heart and it deprived of his brain of oxygen and he was in a coma for two weeks and then his mother had to make a decision to take him off of life support and he and he passed at 15 years old um, so those are the facts of the case what i think i found that maybe some of the other lawyers overlooked was in the documents you know maybe you asked me earlier about you know why our expertise in these types of cases it's because we read everything like i delve into the documents and read every single piece of paper i'm looking for the smoking gun i'm looking for what they did wrong so that i can prove the case it's not always there in justin's case it was there it was, I could tell you what it was. It was Trouble Ticket 61. We tried this case seven years ago and I still remember it was Trouble Ticket 61 because it was repeated so many times during the trial because if they just would have completed Trouble Ticket 61, he'd be alive today. So Trouble Ticket 61 said, three years before Justin died, someone called in and said, 
there's an issue with bamboo in this backyard, and a work order was actually issued by FPNL that said, trim bamboo from the lot. Bamboo is the fastest growing plant on earth, and it's not a tree, really. It's a weed or a grass, and it can grow 60 feet in 60 days. To remove bamboo from a backyard, you have to do it in a very special way. That's, I've consulted with my arborist experts, and what you're supposed to do is you dig it up, or you cut it down, you dig it up, and you have to dig up all the roots that have called rhizomes that go under the ground and connect. They have to be dug up. Then you have to put down some sort of insecticide or something, something to kill the roots. And then you gotta come back a week later and mow it again. And then eventually you can make sure it's gone and it's not coming back. And had they done that correctly, we wouldn't be here. So in this case, the tro trouble ticket 61 said, trim bamboo from the backyard. FPNL and my expert had different definitions of what that means. FPNL took the position that trimming the bamboo down to the stump was the equivalent of removing it. Mm. It's gone. They trimmed it. My expert took the position trimming the bamboo down to the stump is worthless because in two weeks, a new stalk is gonna grow right next to it. And it's gonna be 60 feet tall in 60 days, it's gonna be above the power line. So when my experts that I've talked to in these cases talk about what the proper way to eradicate or get rid of bamboo from your backyard is you need to remove it. Um, so the trouble ticket itself, if you're thinking of the word trim, was the wrong prescription to begin with, right? It should have said remove, but it said trim. But their their tree trimming contractors should know that. They are arborists. I'm not an arborist. I know this because I've handled these types of cases. But these are certified arborists that should know that if they trim the bamboo, just cut it, it's going to grow right back. So the whole theory of the case was very, very simple. If you just would have done the job appropriately and removed the bamboo, it wouldn't have been there three years later for Justin to climb to his death. It's very simple. And that's exactly how the jury saw it when we took the case to trial. Um, that was what our argument was. If FPNL had just done their job, um, Justin would still be here. And um, unfortunately they didn't. There's certain things that people know about bamboo. You would expect a power company to know to even more. Um, many people don't know that the when Thomas Edison invented the first light bulb, the very first filament he used was made out of bamboo because it's a conductor of electricity. Um, but FPNL knows bamboo is dangerous because FPNL has a vegetation management program. It's a document. So. I think it's a nine page document. I think I know it verbatim because um, I've seen it so many times and it's been a feature in so many cases. And there was a section in FPNL's vegetation management uh, program that talks about certain species of plants that are what they call critical removal species. And there are two in the world that are on there. So it's a palm tree growing directly underneath the power line. They need to be removed because um, the, they're gonna, the fronds are going to grow into the line. And it's bamboo, bamboo growing underneath or adjacent to a power line. Either one of those, when you see that situation, for FPNL should be a flashing red light. This is a critical removal. We need to get rid of this stuff. You know, FPNL doesn't often do things to prevent future tragedies. In this particular case that we've been talking about, the Dominguez case, so first... They don't do. They don't write the right prescription for removal instead of trimming. It's a, it's really a comedy of errors that leads. It's really a tragedy of errors that leads to this this catastrophe. Then they have their folks go out there who should know to remove it, and they don't do it properly, so it grows back. Then, Justin's incident happens, and he is electrocuted. His trial doesn't happen until six years later. Okay, because again, from the fourth lawsuit involved, 
fourth law firm involved in the case. Things get delayed, but literally we are in trial six years to the anniversary of his death. Literally the verdict's gonna come in six years to the anniversary of his death on that day. Um, and my partner and I, before the trial started, decided, you know what, let's drive out and let's look at the backyard where Justin was, was killed. And let's see if FPNL has cleaned it up. And lo and behold, we get to the backyard and it is a jungle of bamboo. There is more bamboo that existed before this child died. Um, there's more now, six years later. It grows, it spreads, it can cover the whole backyard. It was, it filled the entire easement, it was filled with bamboo. Um, which, remember, a child has died here, which means another child, or many other children, could have died. Just by luck, no other kid climbed it, but it could have happened. So when we went there, and we saw the bamboo, we then came to trial, and we put FPNL employees up on the stand, and we asked one of their employees, have you been to the yard lately? And surprisingly, she said, I, I have. I went there this morning, right before, right before trial. Had you ever been there before, since Justin died? Nope. Okay, why'd you go there today? Well, I just wanted to see it, because I was going to testify. Well, we had been there, because that's what we do. Before we try a case, we like to go back to the scene and kind of get a feel for what's around. So we knew what was in the backyard. We knew, and she knew, that that backyard was filled with bamboo. Not only did she know that, she knew what we knew, which is one of the stalks of bamboo was growing diagonally and had hit the power line and had burnt off and there was a burnt switch laying on the ground. Okay? So when she was on the stand and we got a chance to cross-examine her, we said, so you went to the scene of the incident today. Tell the jury what you saw. What do you mean? Did you see any bamboo? Yeah. Okay. Did you see a lot of bamboo? Yeah. Did you see the bamboo growing directly into the power line? Yes. Did you call anybody after you saw that to see if they would do anything about it? No. Why, why not? Uh, I don't know, but I, I'm going to do that. So the question is, you know, how do we, how do we value a human life that's been taken needlessly um, due to, you know, the negligence of a power company, which are the cases that I'm involved in. Um, the law will say there is no exact measure, right? Every, there, there's no, there's no value. Um, it's invaluable. Now, some people will say invaluable means it's something that has no value at all and money won't do anything. Some people will say invaluable means something has a very dear and, and significant value. So in the, in the Dominguez case, she had lost her first son. Um, and so we, we told the jury about what she lost. And we told her, I think, in a very, um, in a way that anybody who has children can connect with. So I, I put Mrs. Dominguez up on the stand and she had been crying all week, which is normal in a case like this. And I think the first thing I said to her is the jury has seen you cry enough this week. Um, why don't you tell us about some of the good times with Justin? And I pulled family pictures from when Justin was a baby through the last time she saw him, which was Thanksgiving three weeks before he was electrocuted. And I threw the pictures down on the stand in front of her, and I asked her to tell the jury, tell us what we were doing here. And I heard stories that I had never heard before. And I've known this woman for years representing her. And a couple stories stood out um, to show the loss. And Probably the story that sticks with me the most, again, because I had kids of similar ages, she said, and she, you know, she's poor. She said, I had a job and um, I used to work at McDonald's. 
and I had to get up at four in the morning and I had to walk a mile to work in the dark every day. She said, my 15 year old son woke up every morning at four o'clock in the morning and he walked to me to work to make sure that I was safe. And I don't know how you put a value on that, but I had a 15 year old son and the idea of him getting up at four in the morning and walking his mother to work, I mean, that's some, that's a, that is a special relationship. The last picture I showed her was him as a 15 going on 16 year old sitting on the couch. She said, oh my God, that was Thanksgiving, three weeks before he died. And he was sitting on the couch with his arm around his mother, just like proud and loving. And it doesn't, you don't really have to say a number to a jury like that, because there is no, there is no number that's too much um, to compensate someone for that kind of loss. So we, we, we try to show juries what the loss is in, in human terms. And I, I, think, um, I think that's why the jury did what they did in that particular case, which is they, they, they compensated this mother for the, for the loss and they, they punished FPNL for, for their negligence. Our dedicated service defines us. Aloya, Roland, Lubell, and Morgan. Discover our firm for yourself at lawdefined.com. Located in the heart of downtown Fort Myers, just blocks from the courthouse.